Courtney, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm actually going to turn the, uh, the line over to Madhavi Reddy from HRSA for some introductory remarks. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Hi, everyone. This is Madhavi Reddy. I am a senior public health analyst in the Division of MCH Workforce Development in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau at the Health Resources and Services Administration. I am one of three project officers that works with the Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Program. Um, I want to take a few minutes today to thank you for joining the fourth evaluation capacity building webinar for the HRSA Pediatric Mental Health Care Access and Screening and Treatment for Maternal Depression and Related Behavioral Disorders Program. Uh, today's webinar will focus on a, the evaluation of training. Uh, since this is the last webinar until the fall, I would like to encourage you to go back and review the webinar archives to refresh your memory and to act, assess how the topics presented this year uh, can help you with the evaluation of your program's activities. Uh, we would like to thank you for providing JBS with great feedback after the June 6th webinar. Um, as part of the feedback, JBS asked some questions about the current status of, your, of training in your program to facilitate today's webinar. Uh, those of you who provided webinar feedback indicated that you intend to use the following training mechanism, uh, in-person training events, webinars, uh, online methods, resources, and uh, project echo. Uh, some respondents share that they have not, con uh, they have not conducted trainings yet. Um, in terms of the PMHC programs that have conducted trainings, um, they have trained pediatricians, family physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and primary care providers. Uh, for the MDRBD programs that have conducted trainings, they have trained family physicians, nurse practitioners, case coordinators, obstetricians, gynecologists, nurse midwives, and uh, primary care providers. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have two awardees speak about their current processes for evaluating training. Uh, the, the awardees include the New Jersey PMHCA program and the Florida MDRBD program. Uh, JBS will provide some brief comments on training evaluation prior to the awardee presentation to set the context for these presentations. Uh, we look forward to hearing the presentation and your comments in the question and answer session to follow. Uh, now I'm going to turn the webinar back over to Amanda uh, from JBS to provide a welcome and some brief, brief housekeeping information, as well as updates on the HRSA MCHB evaluation. Um, as, as JBS draws closer to submitting required materials to the Office of Management and Budget for approval of the evaluation data collection tools, we will require some information from you about your program, which Amanda will discuss today. Uh, JBS will be sending an information request to awardees uh, for this information tomorrow, and we appreciate your cooperation and prompt participation in providing this information. So with that, I'll thank you once again um, and, uh, for participating in today's webinar, and I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Great. Thanks, Madhavi. And good afternoon, everyone. Like Madhavi said, I'm Amanda Gmerick from JBS, and I'm the evaluation lead for the HRSA MCHB evaluation contract. We're happy to have you join us today for the fourth evaluation capacity building webinar. Before we get started, I'm going to provide some housekeeping details regarding webinar logistics. For today's roll call, please enter your state and program name, either PMHCA or MDRBD, into the chat box located on the left-hand side of the screen, and push Send. At the end of today's presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Please hold all questions regarding the presentations until the end. When it is time for the Q&A, we will give you instructions on how to ask questions. You can also type your questions in the chat box. If you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box for assistance. Please type your question into the chat box and push send. I or JBS IT support will assist you as soon as possible. Today's meeting will be recorded, and once the recording is available, a download link will be provided to all awardees. So as Madhavi said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evaluation timeline and next steps. 
if I can get my slides to move. There we go. <laughs> so moving on from housekeeping, I want to talk to you briefly about the HRSA and CHB evaluation timeline and next steps, as well as provide some background information as context for today's awardee presentations on evaluation of training. Regarding the HRSA and CHB evaluation, we shared this timeline during our June webinar, but this is just a reminder of how data collection for the HRSA and CHB evaluation will be implemented. The items that will require your coordination and or participation include the program implementation survey and semi-structured interview, as well as the healthcare provider and practice level surveys. So we want to talk a bit about next steps related to these evaluation activities. So as we've discussed with you before, the OMB package for the HRSA and CHB evaluation data collection tools is due in October 2019. We've developed draft data collection tools and protocols and are in the process of refining those and we need your input to assist with finalizing the protocols. So tomorrow we're going to send project directors an email with a link to provide several pieces of information within the next two weeks. The first piece of information will be the estimated total number of healthcare providers and practices that will participate in your program over the five-year course of your program. This information will be helpful because OMB requires an estimate of burden both in terms of participants' time and cost of their time to participate in the evaluation. And your estimates of participating healthcare providers and practices will help us in calculating the time and cost burden. So to calculate the time burden, what we do is basically multiply the number of respondents that you'll provide to us and the time that we expect it will take for them to participate in the evaluation and basically divide that by 60. So for an, easy, for an easy example, let's say we have 60 physician assistants who will complete the healthcare provider survey and we expect it will take about 10 minutes to complete. That would be about 10 hours of time burden for them to complete that survey. So we would then take that time burden to calculate the cost burden, where the time burden is multiplied by the median hourly wage for each respondent's job category using Bureau of Labor Statistics wages. The next thing we're going to ask you to provide is how you would prefer the healthcare provider survey and the practice level survey to be administered. So the two options are that we would provide you with the survey links to email directly to participating providers and practices. And the second, second option being that JBS would email the links to participating providers and practices using email addresses that you provide to us. This information is helpful um, as we finalize our data collection protocols because the procedures that we use will differ based on the survey administration method. The final piece of information that we'll ask for is how your program is known to participating providers and practices. This information will help us in customizing the data collection communications and tools completed by your participating providers and practices, which will be more salient if respondents recognize your program name. So again, we really appreciate your providing this information and look forward to incorporating your responses into the HRSA and CHD Evaluation OMB Package submission. In terms of other next steps, uh, we have an evaluation TA webinar scheduled for September 5th at 3 o'clock Eastern. I think everybody should have an appointment for that on their calendars. And that will include detailed data collection protocols based in part on the information that you provide to us over the next couple of weeks. And then as we've discussed, beginning in spring or summer 2020, we will begin data collection for the HRSA and CHB evaluation uh, pending receipt of OMB approval. So I will be happy to answer any questions about the evaluation timeline or next steps during the Q&A portion of today's webinar, but I'm now going to shift focus to talk about a bit about evaluation of training. <coughs> and so this image may look familiar if you participated in the first evaluation capacity building TA webinar in April. In that webinar, we discussed the important linkages between program components and data collection. And so here we're showing how we've covered the foundational pieces of your programs throughout the previous webinars, including practice provider and encounter level data in webinar one, program branding for promotion and evaluation in webinar two, 
evaluation of telehealth services in webinar three, and now training and training evaluation in today's webinar. So in terms of evaluation of training, a key element is to have a clear understanding of your training program components and how they're being implemented. So for example, will training focus on assisting providers in accessing consultation services, increasing providers' knowledge of behavioral health, advancing delivery of behavioral health services in clinical practice, or something different. Once the training program has been clearly defined, the evaluation can be focused on the core training program component. Similarly, the training program objectives should also be clearly defined and should link to your training program components and what you intend to achieve through your training program. For example, following from the examples in the previous slide, this might be increased access to consultation services, increased provider behavioral health knowledge, or increased delivery of behavioral health services. In terms of training approaches, they may vary from online or in-person training to provision of resources to potential use of a project echo or video conferencing model. And it's important to describe the range of training approaches your program uses. In terms of training requirements, whether training is required or optional may impact participation in the training evaluation. And then regarding how providers access training components, how you deliver training may impact the evaluation method you choose. For example, for a one-time online or in-person training, you may choose a one-time online survey. Whereas for training resources, you might examine it analytics to see how and how often these resources were accessed, or consider a follow-up survey to see how the resources were used. For some training activities, it may be appropriate to gather more in-depth information via follow-up interviews or focus groups. This slide includes a few examples of potential training satisfaction questions. And I'm sure we're all familiar with satisfaction surveys, either through administering them or completing them ourselves. These are typically brief, low burden surveys that provide feedback on satisfaction with the quality, content, presentation, relevance, and logistics of training activities. But to gather data to improve your trainings in your program, it can be helpful to go go beyond participant satisfaction to collect data on constructs such as provider efficacy, practice change, or knowledge change. We discussed in our first webinar in April the importance of using the evaluation data you collect. And you can use your training evaluation data to not only understand the quality of your training, but also to inform potential enhancements to future trainings or even to your overarching program implementation, which our awardee presentations will touch on today. With that brief background, I would now like to provide a brief introduction to our first awardee presenters from the New Jersey Pediatric Mental Health Care Access Program, Dr. Stephen Carey and Harriet Lazarus. Dr. Carey is Chairman of Pediatrics, Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine at Seton Hall University. He recently served for 17 years as Chairman of Pediatrics at the K. Hobmanian Children's Hospital at Jersey Shore University Medical Center. Dr. Carey is Co-Principal Investigator for the Pediatric Psychiatry Collaborative, statewide collaboration between primary care pediatrics and child psychology, psychiatry to improve mental and behavioral health services for children. Dr. Carey serves as medical director for the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and also directs the Child Protection Program at the K. Hobmanian Children's Hospital. He is past chairman of the National AAP Committee on Child Youth and the National AAP Quality Improvement and Innovation Network. Dr. Carey is board certified in general pediatrics, adolescent medicine, and child abuse and neglect. He was awarded Pediatrician of the Year in 1987 in New Hampshire and in 2012 in New Jersey. Also joining us from the New Jersey PMHA team is Harriet Lazarus. Harriet serves as the Chief Operating Officer for the New Jersey Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, with responsibility for managing and supervising the implementation of all grant initiatives. In this role, she monitors overall quality of program deliverables, 
and leads project improvement efforts. Harriet currently leads the team for the Collaborative Mental Health Program, an American Board of Pediatrics approved maintenance of certification part four quality improvement initiative to increase screening, referral, and care coordination between, between pediatric providers and child and adolescent psychiatrists. Harriet has developed and managed New Jersey Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics Quality Improvement Initiatives for community pediatric providers on obesity prevention and care management, developmental screening, autism spectrum disorder, child abuse and neglect prevention, postpartum depression, and as asthma care management, all taught within the patient-centered medical home framework. Harriet serves on the New Jersey Interagency Task Force on the Prevention of Lead Poisoning and works closely with the New Jersey Department of Children and Families to bring health education programs to community family success centers across the state. Prior to joining the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Harriet worked as a consultant in both the financial services and healthcare industry. She received her MBA in healthcare management from Boston University. So thank you to Dr. Carries and Harriet for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you. I think uh, the, the uh, beginning was longer than our whole presentation, but thank you for that. So, um, so this is Dr. Carries. I'm going to start first by giving you a little bit of a background about the status of um, uh, care in New Jersey around behavioral health issues, and then Harriet's going to talk a lot more about actually what we're doing for the educational aspects. So uh, first, uh, the uh, project in New Jersey is um, uh, supported by a number of different um, agencies, the, particularly the New Jersey Department of Children and Families, which is the, actually the, uh, the home of the behavioral health services, uh, but then a variety of other participants, too, that I'll talk about in just, uh, in just a few minutes. Before getting into the actual um, telehealth project, um, I did want to talk about the Pediatric Psychiatry Collaborative because the telehealth piece is a really um, an extension and a growth of what we've been trying to do for a number of years in terms of uh, supporting the ability to more routinely and universally screen children uh, for uh, mental health issues and get them into services. Um, so the Pediatric Psychiatry Collaborative, which is uh, on this slide, is um, as I said, it's funded actually by the legislature with the, with the funding going through the Department of Children and Families and then um, subcontracted primarily to the Hackensack Meridian Health System to develop a statewide system. Uh, the uh, project's been in operation for about five years, started in four counties, and now over the last year or so has spread to the whole state. It's based on the Massachusetts model of trying to have the primary care practices and even specialty practices, uh, nurse practitioners, family doctors, regularly uh, use evidence-based approaches to screen for behavioral health issues, and then to help them by having um, a staff of psychiatry, social workers, psychologists at regional hubs to um, provide support for them in terms of getting the kids into the right sort of services and also improving the capacity of the primary care doctors to be more comfortable with the mental health issues. And in particular, and it's true in New Jersey, I'm sure it's true around the country, having child psychiatry actually available to uh, both uh, discuss issues with the pediatricians and the family doctors and also to work with the family. So if there's a, a family where there's a concern about a child and, and the diagnosis is, is not clear, the psychiatrists will actually see that child. Right now they're seeing them um, in, a, in an outpost office. The hope is that with telehealth that will also be brought in-house into the primary care office to uh, enable um, better uh, support for the families. That those services are free uh, for at least the first few services um, until things settle and the uh, a game plan is organized with the help of the hubs. And AAP is very involved with this, as are other, other, other services in the, in the state. AAP particularly useful in helping us to uh, in develop a network of pediatricians and particularly on the educational end to provide uh, educational sessions at MOC, and Harriet will talk about all that going forward. On the next slide, um, we'll see again the purposes of the whole pediatric uh, psychiatry collaborative are to engage 
pediatricians the more regularly and using evidence-based approaches try to early identify kids with uh, needs in a much earlier fashion than they were before, uh, getting them to uh, not just screen for behavioral mental health issues, but particularly over the last year, screen for substance abuse issues also with the kids that come in for regular care into their offices. And then to use the hubs um, to uh, help them with diagnostic clarification, uh, medication consultation if necessary, and particularly with care coordination, using the hubs to make sure that the families get the services they need based on their, their diversity, their language issues, their insurance issues, uh, their other needs, and, and make sure that happens in a fashion by also regularly following up and uh, facilitating the referrals as the uh, as case may be for the needs of that particular family. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see that the whole state now is covered by a series of these hubs. The hubs cover one or more counties. Um, we have a number of subcontracts with many of the major uh, university medical centers around the state to um, help provide that support for the hub at those locations. Uh, and there's about eight of the hubs that are under the Hackensack system. One of the hubs is uh, in the Newark area is, uh, is supported and managed by the Rutgers University Behavioral Health Care. But the whole vision has been to be a statewide system using common approaches to screening common approaches to a data assessment, evaluation, uh, patient satisfaction, and also hopefully over time actually assessing outcomes of the care, not just whether the processes of care were, were completed and were useful to the families. So on the next slide, you can see that over the last, um, particularly over the last several years, uh, we now are statewide. We cover the whole counties, 20 counties in the state. There's over 500 primary care doctors that are part of the system that are regularly screening, regularly submitting data about their screenings uh, to, the, to the central quality uh, evaluation sites centers and 130 individual uh, children have been screened over this course of time for um, uh, behavioral mental health issues and substance abuse issues and, and almost 8,000 consultations have been made uh, to the hubs uh, in terms of getting care uh, for their particular needs. It was always an issue early on that the concern was that the this whole system was just going to push psychotropic medication, but it actually uh, has not. Very, very few actually, very few of the kids actually wind up on medication. Most are involved with getting the kind of help that they need, whether it's a parental support or or behavioral health uh, consultation or psychology or social service involvement for the for the families. So it's been um, a very very successful project to date. We're still working on. Um, Increasing the number of pediatricians, also reaching out to nurse practitioners, family doctors, even trying to get specialists involved now since they see so many kids with, with behavioral health issues. Pediatric residents are actually involved. All the university sites have their residents involved, although uh, they are seen uh, through the auspices of their attending pediatricians. Again, the chapter of the AAP is very involved with helping to identify and grow the the participation rate, as well as the partnership hospitals that are involved with us and the, and the leadership team working regularly through grand rounds and other ways to try to increase visibility of the project around the state. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Harriet to be, uh, begin the next uh, look at what we're doing. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Um, on this slide, um, shows you a little bit about how NJAP helps coordinate all of the registration for pediatric providers who are participating in, um, interested in participating in the regional hubs, and how NJAP then connects them to resources um, to help them get started. Um, we do our um, outreach and registration at, at events, and um, we have a flyer on the left side. It's a hard copy registration, as well as um, we have online registration available. So we are um, we look at various um, methodologies to ensure that pediatricians can have access to the program and easily register, and that we can quickly connect them to the um, to their regional hub so they can get started with um, 
all of the, the pieces that they need. Okay, um, so once the clinician registers um, through any of the, the different methods, um, they receive a welcome email from NJAP with a reminder all, of all of the requirements for participation. They receive a link to a practice demographic survey via SurveyMonkey, and they also receive a link to two introductory webinars. One is about the overview of the PPC, the, the entire network, as well as one webinar about an introduction to the screening tools that are recommended for use as part of hub participation. At that point, um, the providers also receive a link to a private website um, that is housed at NJAAP where they have more information about screening tools, anticipatory guidance materials, parent handouts, et cetera. So as far as training, this is really our first level of training. Anyone who is participating in the hub has access to these resources and they can um, utilize them as, as they're comfortable. Um, again, to, to really establish that link and ensure that um, providers who join the hubs are, um, are working closely with um, the clinicians at the hubs. We, we, NJAP follows up with, um, with the providers with a welcome email, and we also let the regional hub teams know that the pediatricians are joining. And it's really very important, again, it is, as we've been doing this for the past few years, we, um, we are trying to ensure that it's seamless and very straightforward for the providers who join. NJAP is helpful in the front end as far as the registration and the education, and we continue to support in that, in that realm. Um, it's also important for pediatricians, once they join the hub, to really have that working relationship um, and comfort with the team who's at their hub so that the care coordination and the referral work smoothly. And, um, and then once that um, linkage is made, the hub staff emails a new clinician to assist them. Um, just to give you a sense of what our hidden web page looks like, as you can see, it has information about screening. There's a, it's an accordion, how to contact your hub. Um, there's a weekly screening log, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and some additional resources that are available to the participants. And here's a little bit more information scrolling down into the screening and educational tools. Again, we, uh, um, we emphasize um, that there is a webinar recording to view about the different screening tools. The providers can either look at the recording or the PDF, and all of these are active links that we constantly update as, um, as more information becomes available to our team. I had mentioned the, um, the weekly screening log. It, it's a requirement of um, our program for pediatricians once they join to uh, document that um, screenings, which that there's the number of patients they're seeing on a weekly basis and whether screenings are being conducted at each of those, um, at each of those visits. Um, this is collected by provider, not at the practice level. And it has been a challenge. It, it's something that's important. It's important data for us to see. It's important data clearly for our funders to see so that they know that the pediatricians who are participating are actively increasing their screening rates as a result of the education and, as, and obviously about importance of having the, the regional hubs available to them when they've identified a child who is at risk. So we've, um, we're working through that, and at the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about how our collective team has, um, is working to make this an easier um, activity requirement for our providers. We have been telling um, throughout the years, we've been using this as a, one of the benefits of the screening log is telling the providers you can, they can use it as a QI tool um, just to see hopefully the number of, not only the patients, but the number of check boxes are increasing as their comfort level across the practice is increasing with um, implementation of the, the varied um, screening tools. So as I mentioned, we have a tiered approach to, um, to training, and we, um, the, the website is kind of our first option for providers who are participating, and depending upon um, everyone's comfort level, it's, it's a voluntary um, decision tree as to how much more education the pediatricians, the providers are interested in. In addition to the website, we also offer um, a monthly webinar series. It is open to all providers. It's actually open statewide, not just to pediatricians who are participating in the regional hub. We present didactic and case-based webinars. These are presented by um, the hub leadership, subject matter experts, and we even have some um, pediatricians who've been part of 
the, the program for several years help and be part of some of these um, webinars. We find that clearly some of the peer-to-peer -peer education and support is very valuable. Um, we incorporate evidence-based care management and treatment guidelines and everything that in all of the educational components. And um, we encourage all providers to listen either live or on the recorded webinars. We are offering one CME credit and one um, maintenance of certification part two point um, upon successful completion and submission of a post survey. All of these webinars are available on our NJAP website and we do track as to um, people who are watching live versus the archive. Uh, this slide is giving you um, some examples of for, us for this last 12 month period of the webinar topics and our presenters. Um, we talked about social media, screening tools, um, just some of the, the workings of the, the Pediatric Psychiatry Collaborative. We, we do um, get a lot of feedback from our providers and, and everything we're doing while the education might be going out to the providers. We're always asking for feedback about additional topic areas of concern, of interest, and so each year we're, we're, we're looking to, to add to um, the available topics that um, we can share with, uh, with the providers. And this is um, just basically the sample post-webinar evaluation. It's really um, asking them about knowledge gained and um, we do have a comment box. We always do. We ask for any feedback, any additional information that they would like to share with us to help us improve the program. So now um, I'll go into a little bit about our maintenance of certification part four program. That's a bit more of an intensive training that um, is offered through the New Jersey AAP. Again, it is voluntary. It's an optional benefit of participating in the regional hub, and it's now um, starting with year five as of July 1. This is a, a benefit that is offered to all pediatric providers who are participating in the network across the state. We are able to offer 25 ADP Part 4 MOC points for successful completion of this quality improvement program. And the, the training is to provide pediatric practices um, with education to increase mental behavioral health and substance use screening and to improve anticipatory guidance usage, referrals, and care coordination. Um, just a little bit about of background as to results to date. Um, this is um, in results for the first four years of this MOC Part 4 program. We have four, one class per year. Um, so there have been 76 pediatric practices who have been participating um, from the beginning to the end within each of their years. Um, it's for, if you can see for baseline for children age, under age six, at baseline, it was 19.8% of mental behavioral health screening. And by the end of the MOC Part 4 program, um, the providers were up to 75.4%. And for children ages 6 to 18, 34.5% um, were screened at baseline, and that rose to 86.7% at the end of the MOC Part 4 program. Uh, a little bit about the um, the activities that we um, that are included in the MOC Part 4, we um, have an opening learning session. That's a face-to-face -face session. We offer it in various sites across the state to make it easily accessible for the pediatricians who are participating. We encourage their entire office staff or other members of their quality improvement team to join as well. At these sessions, we provide an overview of the screening and referral process, um, representatives from all of the hubs, are in attendance. We talk also about the model for improvement, how to work as a team to use data to make informed decisions about behavioral change and improvements in screening and referral and care coordination. One of the wonderful pieces uh, about the learning, the face-to-face -face learning sessions is we invite representatives from state and community organizations to network with the providers, all of the attendees, before the program starts and we also have a networking break in the middle so they can really um, share information that they have um, to, to support the pediatric practices. In um, We have in information, we have representatives from the Children's System of Care, we have um, representatives from Early Intervention, our Family Success Centers that are statewide um, have representation. So we, we do everything we can to talk about the importance of mental behavioral health concerns, but also bring additional information to the pediatric providers while they're all together in this collaborative setting. So we um, 
we, in addition to the, the face to face learning collaborative, we do monthly data collection and it's, um, we use the AAP National PETA program. It's a software package um, where the, the providers enter the data on random chart pulls. They do um, 20 random medical chart pulls per month, 10 for children 5 and under, and, and 10 for children 6 and above. And, and I'll show you some of the run charts that they receive on a once those um, once that information is submitted um, via KEDA. In addition, we have facilitated quality improvement. Um, as you saw, that we have the monthly webinars. Those are open to everybody. So um, participants in the MOC program are required to participate on three of those webinars, either live or archived. And we we do ask for the the post survey, obviously, to be able to. Um, attest that they have participated on those webinars. We offer, we've been offering monthly technical assistance calls, and um, we also do a face-to-face -face office visit where um, a representative from the NJAP team um, joins, as well as um, somebody from the regional hub, either face-to-face -face or that we use Zoom technology to ensure that um, the, the, PD, the practice has um, representatives from all aspects of this program to ask questions and, and really do care co and coordination. So it's been working out very well. And for every piece of the MOC Part 4, while it's a QI program for the, for the providers, we're constantly making changes. The technical assistance calls, this was the first year we did it, and there was some feedback, some saying that it wasn't as, as helpful as, as they, they had hoped, so we're tweaking that a little bit as we go ahead and preparing for year five. So we're constantly asking for that feedback so that we can um, bring the, the best program that we can to, to all of the providers. And um, finally, we have a closing learning collaborative session where the practices have been presenting storyboards. And the storyboards, we, we give them a template to share their successes, their challenges, and their plans for sustainability. And um, what we've done last year is, um, based on some feedback we have had heard in the past, we did little breakout groups um, so that, that rather than everybody sharing with the large group at the, at the final learning session, um, we, we grouped the pediatric providers based on the size of their practice so that they were sharing among themselves and then um, reporting out as a group. And it really helped with the collaboration and, and the sharing because part of a learning collaborative is not just improving practice within your, your own pediatric office, but really sharing the successes with your colleagues across the state. So we found that to be a very helpful um, way of, of um, changing up the, um, the storyboard presentation to really make it more meaningful. And we also, at the closing learning session, um, we do exit interviews where that, again, is really helping us with our QI. We ask about the different components of the MOC Part 4 program and, and really ask for the honest feedback to help us improve the program for future years. The last piece is a voluntary sustainability study, and that six months Months post the MOC program, where we do, we ask for one additional set of data as well as um, just some qualitative um, information. So, um, this slide is just showing you what the run charts look like for um, that the practices would be receiving as they're going through the, the quality improvement. And this is just showing for the year four MOC part four participants. You can see the increase in screening rates um, from the baseline, which for most was pretty close to zero, and we say that's okay. That's what we're here for. That's what we're all here for. So um, at, for ages zero to five, um, went from 8% to 95% of screening, and for ages six and up, screening rates increased from 6% to 91%. And just some of the, um, the feedback we received at um, the, the closing learning session, again, we have some post, um, you know, survey information. And um, basically, they, um, they, they were appreciating being able to learn from their peers about strategies and tools, which is really one of the important takeaways of having a collaborative. The next slide is just some feedback from the exit interviews. And as I, as I said, we, this is um, clearly some very positive feedback from some of the pediatricians. And, um, we, and then one thing I, point I do want to make, we do get um, approval from the providers to use their quotes. And not only are we able to use their quotes in, in presentations such as this, when we're doing recruitment, it's always helpful to have um, some quotes from colleagues who have participated in the program. It, it does help um, for others to see that um, there's very positive um, outcomes from um, taking the time to participate in this program. 
And here's a little bit on the sustainability study. Again, this is um, voluntary of the, the MOC Part 4 um, participants from the previous year. Um, cycle 6 is where the sustainability component comes in, and they were asked to do um, one more set of, of random chart polls. And as you can see, we're really pleased that um, it's staying at a very high level, pretty constant, um, since the MOC program was completed. This slide is, is showing a little bit about um, just a summary of some of the data. It's program data as well as training data that our providers are completing. Um, the PPC clinicians um, are completing um, demographic surveys, the weekly screening log, which we mentioned, um, and annual surveys. We recently um, distributed a telehealth capacity survey to all of the providers across the state to help us as we're piloting and implementing the telehealth component of, of the overall program. As you can see, the participants in the MOC program have those requirements as well as some of the additional ones that we um, just discussed um, a little earlier about the physician surveys and, and the various types of evaluation that are, are done as, as part of the MOC program. Some lessons learned and, and next steps. Um, another way to help us see what the providers are looking at and how um, we can be most responsive to their needs is we are um, looking at um, use, utilizing Google Analytics to see how many hits are coming to the program web pages and, and our telehealth, the entire um, planning group for the telehealth program is, is looking at um, that as a high priority to put together a web page through NJAP and be able to use analytics to help inform our decisions as to what is needed. Um, in addition, as far as education, um, we are um, looking at opportunities to collaborate with other partners to develop a continuum of statewide learning opportunities to help sustain learning. So the Tier 1 might be the MOC Part 4, and then um, there are the Project ECHO on mental behavioral health that um, ideally providing cross-marketing so that pediatricians can stay current and still be part of an educational program so that um, needs are, are being met. And, um, and clearly, NJAP is, is always here even after an MOC program is completed. We, um, we always do follow-up. We actually do a follow-up office visit or a conference call with the providers um, a year after their, the MOC Part 4 to see how they're doing and, um, and answer any questions and connect them as needed. The final lesson learned is about the screening log. As, we, as I mentioned, it has posed a challenge. It, it has been very cumbersome and, cumbersome and, and it's a, um, a manual process. Um, we've brought this up um, with our team and with our funders, and we're really excited that we're currently piloting an online system to do, this, um, to do the um, weekly screening log. Since um, these slides were submitted, we actually have tweaked the um, the, the different data elements of the, uh, of the screening log, and um, that just went out to all of the providers yesterday via email. Again, anything that we do before we go live, this was piloted with a number of uh, providers um, who've been part of the system to get their feedback, and um, we more to come on this, but um, we're really excited to have an easier way for, to, to collect this data, and I think the pediatricians appreciate that their concerns have been heard, and we are taking that seriously, and we're working on developing um, a new system to, to make it easier for them. I guess that is it, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carries and Harriet, for your really informative presentation. It was so h interesting hearing about your hidden web page and how that works, and also hearing about how you're using that screening log as part of your QI. It is really impressive with your huge increases in screening from the baseline to the end of your MOC Part 4. So thanks for sharing all of that information. Um, so in addition to that interesting presentation, we've had ex some excitement here at JBS where our power is out. So we think we're good with the webinar and everything should continue as, um, as, as is planned. But I'm going to now introduce our next presenter by my iPhone flashlight, since I'm sitting here in the dark, which is, you know, the modern candlelight, I guess. <laughs> so our next presenter is Heather Flynn from the Florida Screening and Treatment for Maternal Depression and Related Behavioral Disorders Program. Heather is a clinical psychologist and professor and vice chair at the Florida State University 
College of Medicine in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Social Medicine. She is the co-director of the FSU Center for Behavioral Health Integration. Dr. Flynn's research is focused on improved identification and treatment of behavioral health disorders in women, especially around the time of childbearing. Her studies are specifically aimed at developing and testing psychotherapeutic treatments for depression and co-occurring behavioral risk issues in medical and community settings. Dr. Flynn is also conducting projects focused on advancing the field both nationally and in the state of Florida through facilitating collaborative research networks to enhance synergy. Hello. Hi, I think they lost power. Yeah, I think so. Hi, this is Veronica from JBS. I believe Amanda, my colleague Amanda, they must have lost the connection, so I can keep going with the with Heather's introduction. So. Uh, Dr. Flynn is also conducting projects focused on advancing the field both nationally and in the state of Florida through facilitating collaborative research networks to enhance synergy among experts in depression and related chronic illnesses. She is the co-chair of the Florida Mental Health Collaborative and the chair of the Women and Mood Disorders Task Group within the National Network of Depression Centers. Dr. Flynn is a member of the Mo Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers and has been conducting training and supervision in MI with various settings and professionals for over 15 years. She is also a trainer and supervisor in other behavioral interventions, such as interpersonal psychotherapy for depression, and serves on the executive board of the International Society for Interpersonal Psychotherapy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heather. We look forward to hearing about your program's work in training and evaluation of training. And now I will turn over the presentation to you, Heather. Well, thank you so much. You pitched in seamlessly during that bio. I really appreciate it. And I am um, sorry to hear there must be storms in, in the area up there. Um, really pleased to be able to talk to everybody today. And I was really impressed to hear about the New Jersey project. I took lots of notes on that one, as New Jersey is uh, much further along um, than Florida, although we're, we're at, at a time in Florida where um, both maternal mental health and pediatric behavioral health integration um, is definitely on the radar. So um, I am going to talk a little bit about the, the plans for the Florida BH Impact Project, Improving Maternal and Pediatric Access Care and Treatment for Behavioral Health. So we are very uh, fortunate to have um, the HRSA MDRBD funding for maternal mental health um, and also have a separate um, grant where we're developing some similar um, initiatives around pediatric behavioral health integration, which I won't talk about today. Um, I wanted to introduce our project team. Many of these um, individuals are on the phone today. Um, this project is a partnership with the Florida Department of Health. Um, Sarah Beard is our coordinator at the Department of Health. Um, we have our program coordinator, Dr. Kelly O'Dare-Wilson, um, here at FSU, our data manager, uh, Oha Wong, and Lathira Charleston is our fiscal manager. Um, and we, as I said, we have a variety of, of partners that I will say more about in a few moments. Um, one of the things that's probably obvious to everyone on the call um, and, the, and the reason that Florida has been embarking on this over the past few years um, is related to the fact that, you know, again, everybody knows this, but a, a minority of women with depression, anxiety, psychiatric, and substance use disorders don't get detected or treated in the context of uh, pregnancy and postpartum, and so uh, in about 2015, um, our state Medicaid office kicked off a meeting, and we formed the a statewide coalition focused specifically on improve identifying gaps and improving 
uh, outcomes for women with behavioral health disorders around the time of pregnancy, um, known as the Florida Maternal Mental Health Collaborative. And we have stakeholders throughout the state from various different, um, representing various different agencies that have been working on this since about 2015. So I'll, I'll say more about that. Um, in terms of our specific program, the Florida BH Impact Program, um, the, the components on the slide um, are the major activities and components of our program. So um, implement, full implementation of the use of brief validated screening tools for depression, anxiety, and substance abuse in pregnancy and postpartum, uh, access for patients and clinicians to comprehensive referral resources in their regions for mental health and substance abuse services. We are actively working on that right now. Um, similar to the McPat for Moms program in Massachusetts, we will be opening a, a psychiatric telephone consultation line for obstetricians. Um, this will include tracking and reporting of information and measures related to the program's processes and outcomes. Uh, training of OB providers in best practice maternal behavioral health screening treatment and risk issues. And then we'll also be training the behavioral health providers in the targeted regions in evidence-based treatment. Um, and we're really going to focus a lot on the training of the behavioral health providers because, you know, it's wonderful to screen women and facilitate and assist obstetricians and OB clinicians with um, initiating treatment, with, with triage, with referral. Um, but really, the, the vast treatment literature shows that unless people get connected with treatments that are likely to work, um, their psychiatric disorders um, will, not have a, will not remit. So we're really keen on training the behavioral health providers as well, making sure they're up to speed not only in evidence-based psychotherapies and medication management, but also perinatal-specific um, programming. So as I mentioned, um, our major partner is the Florida Department of Health um, and the Florida Maternal Mental Health Collaborative, as I described a few moments ago. We also have a formal partnership on this grant with the Florida Healthy Start. Um, they have been implementing an evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy treatment program for home visitation uh, known as Moving Beyond Depression, which originated um, in Cincinnati at Cincinnati Children's. Um, and we will be expanding that to some other regions in Florida as part of this program. Uh, we have formal partnerships with the community behavioral health centers in the region, our Florida Department of Children and Families, um, the Florida uh, chapter of ACOG, as well as uh, a very important partnership and consultation with McPat for Moms, known as Lifeline for Moms. For those of you who aren't familiar with Florida, um, we are the third largest state, have a little over a quarter million um, births annually. Um, we did not think it was feasible to, to target the entire state in our first few years of this program. Um, so for a variety of reasons, we are focused on the counties that you see highlighted here. Um, Alachua is the Gainesville, Florida area. Duval is Jacksonville. And Leon is Tallahassee, the capital of Florida. And the counties that are surrounding are all um, rural counties that we will also be targeting for this specific project. Our goal is to implement the program fully in these regions. Um, learn our lessons, modify, uh, enhance the program, and then use our statewide partners to expand this statewide. So our approach to healthcare provider training, um, firstly, we will have um, psychologists and psychiatrists training the obstetricians in all aspects of um, detection, treatment, management, referral, uh, monitoring for mental health and substance abuse disorders in the perinatal period. Um, I will say a little bit more about that in a few moments, but um, we will certainly be including in our training information on 
screening tools, the appropriate uh, use of screening tools, um, diagnosis, triage, treatment, management of psychiatric disorders in pregnancy and the postpartum, um, including all aspects of medication use in pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, psychotherapeutic treatment options, adjunctive supports and treatments, um, and, and risk issues, including suicide risk, risk, risk for child abuse and neglect. Um, and then issues around referral and ongoing coordination and communication with behavioral health providers. Um, we are not at the point of, um, uh, we haven't conducted or, or formalized or finalized our trainings as of yet. Um, we will be consulting um, very heavily with Lifeline for Moms on the trainings, but as an overview, we will have a mix of training formats, including in-person training, such as lunch and learns. Um, everybody who's worked with physician practices, I think, know that it's, it's difficult to have extended hour trainings, um, given the clinical responsibilities. So we're going to kind of save the in-person trainings for things that um, make sense for in-person training. But we'll have also a combination of video conferencing, webinars, and we will be working through our major um, collaborative entities in Florida, which are all, um, you know, have been around for a while and have lots and lots of partners. The District 12 ACOG, as I mentioned, we have an annual um, uh, conference of the Florida M Maternal Mental Health Collaborative, known as the Florida Perinatal Mental Health Conference. Um, that's in October uh, this year. Um, and then I'm part of two other statewide initiatives, the Florida Perinatal Quality Initiative, as well as the Florida Maternal Opioid um, Collaborative. And so we will be, you know, partnering with all these different conferences and programs to add on training opportunities. So, for example, the first few days of August, our psychiatrist consultant, Dr. K. Russos Ross, and I will be at the Florida ACOG meeting to promote the project, provide information, and recruit OB providers. We're also um, planning uh, right now for September our first physician-to-physician -physician networking event, which will be an event that um, includes pediatricians, obstetricians, and psychiatrists. Um, we'll be doing brief presentations about the program, about training opportunities, as well as just you know, really facilitating these providers getting to know each other for um, the ease of uh, future referrals back and forth. Um, the training evaluation, again, we'll be really looking forward to our consultation with Lifeline for Moms. Um, those of us who've been working with primary care practices for a while know that they all need to be customized to the individual practice, um, but we will be um, really relying on Lifeline for Moms. So, for example, um, we learned about the wonderful uh, provider and practice self-efficacy tools that have been developed by Lifeline for Moms, specifically around um, self-efficacy for detecting and treating and managing psychiatric disorders in pregnancy. Um, we'll likely be using their tools. Um, but we will also be looking at things like knowledge and practice change, and then, of course, all of the um, important metrics uh, for HRSA and for JBS, including um, rates of screening, referral, all the things that, um, you know, we'll, will be really important to track. Um, the training evaluation will include all of the program components, screening, psychiatric consultation, referral and care coordination and um, training, ongoing training. I think I forgot to mention that our trainings um, through the um, FSU College of Medicine will be um, CME and CEU uh, will, uh, based, so um, that will all be part of the training as well. Um, our training and implementation for both our pediatric and maternal behavioral health programs will be based on the Plan, Do, Study, Act model uh, cycle. Um, and I won't go into too much detail here, but um, 
again, through our consultation with Lifeline for Moms and through our meetings with the providers and the practices, we will plan um, different components, and in, including the training format and content that is feasible, desired, effective, um, and to build in measures of the, what I was just referring to, the satisfaction, knowledge change, practice change, um, and then the action or the do part is to provide the trainings and capture the measures, um, and then the, the early healthcare sites that participate, we will use their results to modify and refine future training plans involving not only our entire team and stakeholders, but also the practices um, that we're working with, and then to revise, implement the revised training plan in, in the future additional clinics. So that's our broad kind of conceptual model of how we will evaluate our training program. Um, we are in the midst of uh, clinic recruitment right now, um, consultation with Lifeline for Moms, um, orientation and training for our own staff. Um, it's kind of interesting. There's a storm in your area. Our, our project was delayed a few months because Hurricane Michael hit our region um, right after this grant was funded and our Florida Department of Health um, needed to take a lot of time and we're still <laughs> doing um, emergency response for, for the hurricane, but we feel like we're at a point now where we're, we're really um, uh, focused on engaging the clinics, devising our training materials and our training evaluation plan, and um, we're extremely excited to be able to do this in the region. The, um, our new governor, Ron DeSantis, and our new first lady, First Lady Casey DeSantis, have uh, made mental health a priority in the state, and so we're, we're really optimistic that there's a focus in Florida now on, the, on mental health. Um, especially in pediatrics and in the perinatal period. Um, the First Lady is working on developing a statewide mental health resource directory, which is really interesting timing because as part of this project, we're about five months into developing a statewide maternal mental health resource directory that's geocoded and searchable by um, uh, you know, county or insurance or expertise of the providers. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really, um, you know, ho anticipating quite an impact on the state from this project. So we're really appreciative to HRSA for supporting this and JBS for providing the evaluation component. And I will take any questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name clearly. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. It will take a few moments for the questions to come through. Please stand by. We show no questions at this time. Hi, uh, I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, if so, can you chat me? Oh, great. Hi, so, Linda. Yes, we can hear you right now. Great. Thank you so much. I was trying to speak earlier. I'm 
Heather, I'm so sorry I got cut off during your bio, but thank you to Veronica for jumping in. We are having some storms here and uh, are losing our connectivity, but I um, wanted to say thank you, Heather, for your presentation. I, I got to hear and see part of it when I was able to rejoin, and it just sounded really interesting. It sounds like you have a really great menu of training options. Really interested in that annual conference that brings folks together in October. That sounds like a great opportunity. Um, and also, as you were mentioning at the end, that statewide maternal mental health directory sounds like a really great resource for folks within your state. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read a few of our chat questions until we see if the operator has any questions for us on the line. Um, so. Mary Margaret Gleason from Louisiana asks if there's a way of sharing the MOC approval that already went through AAP. So I think that would be for uh, Dr. Carries and Harriet. Hi. Um, yes, we'd, we'd be happy to, to share what um, we've submitted. So um, Amanda, offline, if you let us know the best way of doing that. Um, the, the process has changed a little bit with ABT since our original submission, but we're happy to share um, no, no use in reinventing the wheel, absolutely. Great. Yeah, and that's what Mary Margaret says. And so, yeah, if you get that, we'll coordinate offline and we'll share that information. Thanks so much, Harriet and Mary Margaret, for your question. Um, Marty Blair from Montana says, would it be possible to get more information about the weekly screening log tool that New Jersey uses? It appears to be a useful tool, and they would like to replicate it if possible. Um, sure, I could talk to our, our team about that. Um, the, the screening log is one of the slides was basically what the tool is. It's something that we um, started using um, through our evaluators early on in the process um, in order to be able to provide at the, at the time the Department of Children and Families with um, screening information. So um, we will talk to our team and, and we'd be happy to share it. As I said, there's a lot of useful information from the pediatrician side. It, it is rather manually intensive. We, we tried even doing it as an Excel sheet, but again, it's, um, if there's a way that um, the data could be downloaded from an EMR, that's, um, that would probably be an, an easier way for, um, for the providers to um, get that information out um, in a in a much easier fashion. So, uh, but we're happy to to share the data elements of of the screening log. This is the first one, and then we're still, as I mentioned, we're just testing and piloting the more streamlined online version with um, a significantly less significantly less data elements that are being required of the participants. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks for your question, Marty. Uh, operator, do we have any questions on the line? We do have one question on the line. Your line is now open. Speaker, are you on mute? We can't hear you. If you press star one, your line is now open for your question. Well, maybe the person, uh, redacted their question. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Melinda Campopiano, one of our senior medical advisors here at JBS, that follows on the previous questions, um, asking if you have a means for spot auditing the clinician weekly screening log, New Jersey PMHC 18. I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It was a little um, fuzzy in the beginning of the question. Oh, sure about it. it. Sure, yep. So the question is, um, following from the previous question about the screening log, do you have a means for spot auditing the cl clinician weekly screening log, so doing any sort of interim audits of the data? Um, we, we, we do not do that. Um, we, um, we ask them to submit it, and um, so we have not gone back to check. We do try to do a quality assurance in the sense that um, 
following up, up with providers who have not submitted weekly screening logs to go back to them and see how we might be able to help them make it an easier process. So it's more about those practices that have found it a considerable burden and haven't been submitting. And we know they're screening, but unfortunately, um, we don't have their numbers. That's been our, our higher priority. And we're hoping that the online form will, will help with that and make it much easier um, for, for everybody to submit their data. Great. Thanks for that info. Operator, do we have any other questions on the line? As a reminder, please press star 1 on your phone and record your name if you have a question. And also, Madhavi, would like to open it up to you with any questions or comments for our presenters. Um, thanks, Amanda. I don't have any um, questions at this time. Um, I think I saw that uh, someone may be typing something into the chat pod, um, so maybe we can wait to see if there are any further questions that come through the chat pod. But um, yeah, I don't have any comments at this time. Thanks. And we show no further audio questions at this time. Great. Well, it looks like that is all of our questions from the phone line and from the chat. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Carries and Harriet from the New Jersey PMHCA team, as well as Heather from the Florida MBRBD team. We really appreciate your presentations today. Very interesting and informative. Uh, just a reminder that our next gathering will be on September 5th at 3 o'clock Eastern. And as I mentioned, we'll be in touch by email requesting those certain pieces of information tomorrow. And if you can send that within the next couple of weeks, that would be great. Thanks again for joining today, and we will uh, talk in September. Thank you. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.